Praise the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made. We are going to rejoice and be glad in it. I'm Pastor Patrick Harvin. I want to welcome you all to our Wednesday night Bible study. We thank God for so many of you all joining us. And please, if you don't mind, take a quick moment and invite someone to Bible study. Share it on your timeline. Um, send somebody a text message with the link. Whatever you got to do, let's get this word out tonight because the Lord has been mighty good to us. And he has a lot to say to us tonight through his word. I'm excited to share um, from the book of Amos tonight. And as we get ready to go into the book of Amos, I want you to um, be mindful that although we're in the Old Testament, a lot of the things that are that happened in Amos are applicable to us today. There's nothing new under the sun. So we want to take the principles of God's word and apply them to our situation as it is right now and in today. All right, so let's have a word of prayer. We'll get right into the word of God. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is life unto us, God. And we bless your holy and most righteous name, God. We thank you from the rising of the sun to the going down. You have been so good to us, Lord. You have been so merciful and so kind to us. And we thank you, Father, for giving us an opportunity to come together to share and study your word together. Open our understanding, God, that we may hear from you and choose to glorify you. And give you all honor, praise, and glory. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit of Christ desires to say to the church tonight. Father, for that person struggling tonight, I thank you that they even made it to this to the um, Bible study. And I pray, to God, that you would bless them and give them resolution and answers tonight. Oh, my God, we thank you. We love you and we adore you. Even now, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. All right, let's get to work, y'all. The book of Amos coming from starting in chapter number four. Now, last week, just as a point of review, uh, we left off. And, and by the way, y'all, the study notes are posted. If you want to go out there and grab those um, to kind of follow along with us tonight, um, we have posted the study notes and the study guide is available. JBCHopkins.org forward slash study notes. All right. Y'all hear me good. Somebody say we hear you, Pastor. Praise God. Praise God. All right, y'all. So what we're going to do is go back to chapter four. Um, as we left the beginning of the book of Amos, I told you that Amos, um, many believe that his whole prophecy was only a week long. Maybe his whole ministry was only about a week. Amos is from Tekoa. So it's a rural area outside of about 10 miles outside of Jerusalem. He grew up, he was raised up in Judah. And during this time, the people of God in Israel, they had tremendous prosperity. It wasn't, they didn't, they had enemies around them, but God was blessing them and they were prospering in a phenomenal way. And so God takes this country boy, Amos, who doesn't have the theological training that a lot of people do at the time. And God sends him to minister to elite people, to people that are prospering in the middle of their prosperity. And God sends him to shake some things up, to bust some things up. And so just to give you a little bit of the backdrop. And so Amos is able to do what God tells him to do um, because he doesn't know anybody that he's not trying to impress anyone. He didn't have anything to gain from it other than obedience to God's word. And so this is where we find the prophet um, in the text today. We talked about how God used him. One second, y'all. We talked about how God used him to minister to all the people, the, the to tell the people of God about the nations around them and how ungodly they were and all the things they were doing wrong and how the people of God were probably happy celebrating. Like, yeah, get them, Amos, get them. Only to, only to find that God was literally encircling all the nations around them. And now God hones in and starts to now, I've dealt with your enemies. Now I'm going to deal with you. He starts off with Judah and then he gets on Israel. Israel sins, as, as we told you, as we shared the word last week. Um, you can find them in chapter number two. If you go to the study guide, it's on page number two of the study guide. Israel sins. They had problems. They perverted justice. They oppressed the poor. They did abominable uncleanliness inside of God, incest and fornication and whoredoms and lusts. Um, they, they operated in pretense and, and they perpetrated like they loved God, but their hearts weren't with him. And then it also said that they corrupted the devoted things. They hindered the prophets. They didn't want the truth and they tried to hinder those that were trying to tell them the truth. 
And so this is where they found themselves. We moved on and we got into chapter number three. And as we got into chapter three, we saw a couple of things that God was talking to his people about. One of them was, he said that I have a special relationship with you all, that you're chosen. You are my chosen people. And God says, although I love you, I got to deal with you because love is not love unless there's correction. And the Bible even tells us later that he chastens those that he loves. And so he tells them that you are the only ones I've begotten. You are my chosen. You are, you are my people that I love. God says, but judgment starts at the house of God. Judgment starts at the house of God. So before I deal with your enemies, yes, I'm going I'm to I'm handle them, but I got to handle you also. Okay. And this is what we find going on in chapter number three. Um, we pick it up the text. Let me back into chapter three a little bit, and we're going to pick it up at verse number uh, Amos chapter three. And we're going to pick it up at verse number three. I want y'all to watch the text. It says, can two walk together except they be agreed? Will a lion roar in the forest when he hath no prey? Will a young lion cry out of his den if he hath taken nothing? Okay, so there has to be agreement. God says, I want you to walk in sync with me. I want you to walk in agreement with me. I want you, here's the word we use all month long. I want you to walk in alignment with me. And if you're out of alignment with me, then we're going to have some problems. And God says, I, my whole objective is to get you to walk upright before the Lord. We told you what this agreement look like. What, what do we have to do to walk in agreement with God? We got to know that the word of God is the final authority. The word is final authority. We have to appreciate the art of God is established and, and, and say it's not negotiable. I'm not trying to negotiate with God about his order. God's order is his order. When God says this person's the head, that's what the head is. If God says this person is to submit, that's what's supposed to happen. If God says even in a position of authority, you have to humble yourself under other people's authority, then that's what God, God expects to happen in our lives. And so we have to understand that anytime we get outside of God's order, we get outside of alignment with God. Then we said that we have to recognize and we must agree that we are servants of God and that he's not our servant. That's so important. Let me let me pop up the notes and show you that, that we are his servants and he's not our servant. This is where a lot of people make misconception that we can just make God do whatever we want him to do. God says he's going to follow his word. His word is truth. OK, so when we get out of alignment with the word of God, God ain't obligated to bless what you want. God is going to bless his word. Look at it right there. We said I'm God's servant and he is not mine. First Corinthians chapter six. Verse 19 through 20. Let's go there real quick. First Corinthians 6, verses 19 through 20. Good evening to everyone. I see y'all still coming in. God bless you. God bless y'all. Look at it with me. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20, it says, What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? which you have of God and ye are not your own for we are bought with the price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are whose they are gods. They don't belong to you. Okay. That's so important that we understand that brothers and sisters, that we don't belong to ourselves. And I'm telling you, the sooner we realize that the better off we're going to be in this thing called life that we're living. You don't belong to yourself. We are children of God. We are the the, um, the seed of Abraham. We are God's children. Amen. All right. So now let's keep going. Now, God says, I don't want you to have any fellowship with un unfruitfulness. I don't want you to, to be unproductive. He goes through these themes in, 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 in the chapter. And then he tells them, as we get to chapter number, the end of chapter number three, we're going to start reading at verse number 11. Amos chapter three, verse number 11. Let's go there real quick. Okay, the word says, verse 11, therefore thus saith the Lord God, an adversary there shall be even round about the land and he shall Bring down thy, thy strength from thee, and thy palaces shall be spoiled. Thus saith the Lord, as the shepherd taketh out of the mouth of the lion two legs, 
or a piece of an ear, so shall the children of Israel be taken out of the mouth that dwell in Samaria, taken out that dwell in Samaria in the corner of a bed and in Damascus in a couch. So God says the adversary is going to come, opposition is coming, trouble's coming, and you're going to barely make it. You're going to barely survive. There's going to be a remnant that remains. Okay. Now we got into chapter four. And as we got into chapter four, I alluded to um, teaching on how God was constantly trying to give them um, a chance to get it together, Try, trying to give them a chance to repent, trying to give them a, pass, a chance to turn the corner. And they kept going, doing the same crap. OK, kind of like a lot of us, we keep doing the same crap, even though God gives us time after time, chance after chance. Sometimes we just don't want to change. We just don't want to listen. OK. Listen, if you are doing something and it's not productive, the worst thing you can keep doing is doing the same thing because you are actually you are actually causing what you what you ain't content about, what you're frustrated about. And if you're in sin, guess what? Do something different. Turn that thing over to God and get it right with him. OK, so at some point we got to realize our way is not going to work. At some point we got to realize it's not going to change just because you want it to change. You have to yield and surrender yourself fully to God. Okay. Now let's go into chapter number. Um, let's go into chapter number um, four. Amos chapter four. Word says, "Hear ye, hear this word, ye kind of Bashan, that are in the mountain of Samaria, which oppress the poor, which crush the needy, which say to their ma masters, bring." And let us drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness that lo, the day shall come upon you, and he will take away, take you away with hooks, and your posterity with fish hooks. God says there's a day coming that it's gonna fall apart, that it's all gonna be revealed. Now, when he says the kind of Bashan, that is a certain large type of cow uh in that particular area, and it's a very aggressive cow. And it's hard to keep within their boundaries. So watch this. He says the, the, the enemy that's going to come and overwhelm you and you're going to be taken out of where you're at because you don't want to follow instructions. You don't want to operate within the parameters that God has given us to operate in. OK, so he says the wealthy, they oppress the poor. They crush them. They, they have a cutthroat mentality. People are so materialistic that they do whatever they want to to get ahead, no matter who they hurt in the process. And God is not pleased with this, brothers and sisters. He is not pleased with it. And so he begins to address it. Now we pick up the text tonight and we're going to read starting at Amos 4 again. And we're going to read up until about verse number five. And then we'll take a moment and break some of that down and, and then keep going. Okay. Let's go back to Amos chapter four and let's see what the Lord says to us. Verse two says, the Lord God has sworn by his holiness that lo, the day will come that he will take away with hooks and your posterity with fish hooks and you shall go out at the breaches, every cow at that which is before her and ye shall cast them into the palace, saith the Lord, come to Bethel and transgress at Gilgal, multiply transgression and bring your sacrifices every morning and your tithes after three years and offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven and proclaim and publish the free offerings for this lack of you. God says, y'all like being religious. Oh, yeah, y'all some good church folk. Y'all love being religious. Y'all love going through the rituals. Y'all love making the sacrifices. Pastor, I'm a tither. You know, I give sacrifices. I give. I pray all the time. And, and, and he says, you love going to these places. Notice what he's looking at, what he's saying. You go to these places, but even when you go there, you multiply your transgressions. In, in other words, you just uh, you just a bunch of religious hypocrites, and y'all y'all do know that this word is applicable to the church today, to many of us, because if we're not careful, if all we do is go to places, if and all we do is go through the the procedures of of being saved, the procedures of being religious, but our heart's not in it, or we're not living by what we're going through. I mean, you can tithe all day long, but if you still fornicate, the word still says what it says. OK, so we can't cover over a sin because we do something else right. OK, and so he says, yeah, y'all go to y'all like going to places and you're religious. 
but uh, you're you're still doing it for the wrong reasons. Okay, and so let's keep going. Let's keep going. It's gonna get good. Praise God. I pray y'all y'all getting something out of this. The word says, He says, "Oh, you children of Israel," saith the Lord, "I and all I also have given you cleanness of teeth." In all your cities and want of bread in all your palaces, and you still hadn't changed. God said you're religious, you go through all these motions, and you keep doing the same things. Now, now, what was so significant about those places? Bethel was the place where Abram first pitched his tent and built an altar there. It's the same place where Jacob dreamed a dream, you know, Jacob's ladder, the ladder. But watch this now. After those good things, those, those profound things happened there where they had encounters with God, Bethel at this time is a site where there was a gold, there was a golden calf bill. There was a lot of idolatry there also. And God is trying to get his people to realize that I'm not just in the place. I want to be in place in you. It's not just going to a place to worship me, but I want you to worship me from your heart. I want you to serve me because you love me and you have a relationship with me. OK, so they're stuck on places. God is stuck on being in place. They're stuck on ritual. God is stuck on. I want you to be led by my spirit. I want you to be under my unction at all times. OK, this is the difference between religious people and people that really have a relationship with God. Listen, religious religion is not the issue here. And it's nothing wrong with being religious. But if you are a religious hypocrite, religious religion means simply a religious person means that you practice a certain things over and over repetitively. Okay. That's nothing wrong with that. If your heart is in it, but the problem comes in is when you're doing stuff repetitively. I go to church every week. Why? Because I was told I was supposed to, but as a part of my religion, I go to church on Sunday and I, and I live like a devil the rest of the week. Yes. You are religiously a hypocrite. Okay. So let's, let's make sure we make a distinction that I hear people all the time say, I don't want, I don't want to be religious. I don't want religion. Well, I'm sorry. I need a pattern. I need the word to tell me that I should pray daily. I need the word to tell me that, that I should um, submit myself to God daily. That sounds like some religious practices to me. I need the word to tell me that I love people. I need the word to tell me seven times, seven, how many times I'm supposed to forgive somebody. That ain't one time. That means I have to do it over and over again, religiously observe and keep the commandments of God's word. Okay. So let's, let's make sure we make a distinction there. All right. So then we go on in the chapter, chapter four, verse number six, God says, I've done all these things to y'all to get your attention. And we covered them last week. He brought famine. There was trickle down. One house got blessed. The next house didn't get any rain. God did all these things to get their attention and they yet would not pay attention. They would not yield to the spirit of God. And so God says, all right, now I'm going to do, I'm going to give you another chance. We get to chapter five and God now says, I want you to repent. And chapter five is really a call to repentance, a call to repentance. Let's read it together. Chapter five, starting at verse number one, the word of God says in Amos chapter five, beginning at verse one, hear ye this word, which I take up against you, even a lamentation, O house of Israel. The virgin of Israel is fallen. She shall no more rise. She is forsaken upon her land. There is none to raise her up. But thus saith the Lord God, a city, the city that went out by a thousand shall leave a hundred. And that which went forth by a hundred shall leave 10 to the house of Israel. But, OK, so let's let's talk about what he's saying to us. God's saying that, listen. These people are so, so um, turned up and they so hyper. And they're so happy because they're prospering. And, and we're going to find out in a little bit, they had all this music and stuff they're playing. And I mean, y'all, they were getting, they was, they was having a good old time. And so the people got their little chants and they, um, their ungodly music and they partied it up. And here come Amos with a different song. Amos is that brother that when he gets to the party and everybody see him coming, everybody say, why he show up? He didn't shift the whole room. Their people want to live it up and be happy and just celebrate. And here comes Amos with a stern word from the Lord. And, and they know he's got, he's got a lamentation, which means a sorrowful song, a song of remorse. And yet they got a song, a party song, of songs of the world. We'll find that out in a little bit. OK, so Amos comes and tells them you ought to be grieved. 
you ought to be upset. They ought to, they ought to trouble you. First lady, she's so right. She said, Amos is that dude. <laughs> Amen. You are, it ought to disturb you that, that you're living like this. But ain't nobody saying nothing. Everybody's happy. Everything's cool. Hey, I'm doing, I'm living my best life. I'm doing me. Okay. Listen, there are consequences. And this is what this is what begins to happen. Anytime that you really stand for, for, for the word of God. Now, I'm not saying you stand in as a as a as a uh, mean face, you know, person, or you just always nasty with people. But anytime you stand for truth and righteousness and you have principles and you try to live your life by them, when you do that, people don't want to be around you because they get convicted. So I just need you to paint this picture and see how Amos comes with a lamentation and the folk partying it up. OK, so now that hopefully gives you some context to what's going on here. So in verse number four, listen to what Amos says. This is Breonna, you spot on. She says, people blind just like today in the words of Solomon, there is nothing new under the sun. Absolutely, my sister. Absolutely. Now watch what he says. In verse number, starting in verse number four, he says, but thus saith the Lord unto the house of Israel. He says, I want you to know who I'm talking to. Look at what it, the message is. Seek you me and you will live. If you seek me, you'll live. But seek not Bethel, nor enter into Gilgal and pass not to Beersheba. For Gilgal shall surely go into captivity. And Bethel shall come to naught. Lord, help us. What, what is Amos trying to tell them? God is literally saying to these people, stop running behind the place and run for behind me. There are some people right now in the body of Christ that the, the, the church you're supposed to be in, the place God has for you to serve him in this, in this season of your life, you're not there because of the place you're in. It's more prominent. You got all these big people there or whatever the case is. What is it that's keeping you out of place with God? Amos tells them God is not interested in your places. God is not interested in you seeking those religious places because them places are going to go into destruction. Those cities are going to go down. He says, what you need to do is seek me and you'll live. Now, that seems kind of contradictory because God has already told them that they're going to be going into captivity. So why is it that God will say, I'll, I'll allow you to live? He didn't say there wouldn't be consequences. He didn't say the nation wasn't going to be destroyed. He said that if you seek me, you'll live. I can I can keep you alive. I can sustain you, even though you might have to go through. And as a nation in the United States of America, where I live, as a nation, we're going to start seeing some stuff that are consequences of the actions of the nation in, in whole, in totality. And yes, you're a believer and we're going to pray. And we're going to intercede. But guess what? There are some things that we're going to have to deal with just because of where we live. OK, so God says, but if you seek me. Now, I'm not talking about what your neighbors doing with, with all them other crazy folk doing. I'm not talking about them. If you make the decision to seek me when everybody else doing what they want to do, God said you will live. That's what the word says. I need you to get an understanding of the setting of what, when Amos is saying this. God says, seek me and you will live. Now, if you don't seek him, the opposite is going to happen. You're going to be destroyed just like everybody else. Then look at verse six. He said, them cities, they're going to come to nothing. Seek the Lord and you shall live, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph and devour it and there be none to quench it in Bethel. Ye who turn judgment to wormwood and leave off righteousness in the earth, seek him that maketh, now the God says, let me tell you who you're seeking. Now, you, you're you not seeking Buddha. You're not seeking Muhammad, Confucius, or anybody else. You, you're you not seeking none of these false gods, none, none of those, those gods of the Amorites and all these heathenistic idolaters, um, gods that people were running behind. You're not seeking Molech or Kemesh. You're not seeking none of them. He said, let me give you my curriculum vitae. Let me tell you who you seeking. Let me tell you who I am. Listen to what he says. He says, um, you're going to seek the one who turned judgment to wormwood. You who turned judgment to wormwood and leave off righteousness in the earth. He says, seek him that maketh the seven stars and Orion and turneth the shadow of death into the morning and maketh the day. In other words, he said, seek the one that created the earth. 
Seek the one that created the stars that y'all want to worship. I created all of that. You want to run behind your horoscope? He said, I am God. You don't need the horoscope. You don't need to know your zodiac sign. Come on, somebody. He says, seek me. I'll give you the answers. I'll give you the direction you need in your life. And I'm telling you right now, a whole lot of believers get off track because we want to work. We want to run behind. What is my sign? Oh, I can't marry somebody. That ain't the right sign. All that craziness. And God said, no, I'm God. I'm the one who created the heavens and the earth, the stars. I'm the one that turned the shadow of death into the morning and make it the day dark with night and call it for waters of the sea and pour them upon the face of the earth. I'm the one. He said, the Lord is his name. That's who I am. I'm not telling you to seek me. Uh, I'm telling you to seek me because I know what I'm doing. I am God and beside me, there is none other. So why would you run behind a little G? Why do we do this, y'all? How many, how much of our lives have we spent running behind little G's when we got the big G? God Almighty. God says, I want you to seek me. I'm in control. I have the final say. I know they told you one thing. I know what the doctor said. I know what your circumstances look like. But he says, but in the midst of your struggle, in the midst of the calamity, in the midst of the confusion, in the midst of the trial, and in the midst of the tribulation, God says, still seek me because I'm still in control. Y'all, I don't know about y'all, but that's some good stuff right there. God says, I still got you when everybody else drops you. I still got you. I know that everybody has turned their back on me, but you hold true to my word. You want to honor me. You want to serve me. God says, I still have you. I still got you. Don't you ever let the, the trouble confuse make you confused to think that God's dropped you. God still has you. He said, I want you to seek me. I want you to seek me because you're going to find me. Glory to God. Glory to God. About to get happy here. Let me get back into this, into this lesson. All right. So as we stop there for a moment, let's, let's break down a couple of things here. God tells them if they go back to being religious, if they go back to their places, Bethel, if they go back, kind of like what a lot of us trying to do now, we're trying to be, we want the church to be like it was before COVID. We want the church to be like it was when mama, when we were growing up, we want, we want certain things to be the same way they were. Listen, Principles do not change, but methods have to change sometimes. Principles never change, but methods have to change. The word of God is solid. It ain't changing. But please understand the methodology for, methodology for how we reach people at times has to be updated. For instance, um, and I gave you all this illustration several years ago. Uh, we went to my wife and I, we went to um, a Baptist conference, state Baptist conference, and someone had a, had a great intentions. And they had a beautiful heart. And it was an awesome thing they were trying to do. They had a big old table that said free, um, free um, Bible studies and free sermons and free, free music or whatever it was. The only problem was they had the stuff in cassette tapes. Ladies and gentlemen, it had been at least five to ten years since they stopped making cassette tapes. So they had a good idea, but they had not updated the method. They had the right word on the tape, but the method of getting that word to others had not been updated. So you had young people walking by the table like, what is that? What am I supposed to do with that? And that's how the church is sometimes when we don't want to update our methods because we lack it the way it always was. The problem is, is that reached your generation. And as you're getting older and as you are going to eventually be moving on to go to be with the Lord, if you don't return, then we're going to have a whole nother generations coming behind us that we cannot reach because we never updated our methods. So I need y'all to stop trying to hand out cassette tapes when everything is digital now. Okay. I'm going to need y'all to update your methods. You know, um, you can't even hardly give anybody a CD because they don't make them in cars half the time. Now we need to update our methods. Okay. We got to, we got to update. We got to come up to the times that we're living in now. So, he tells them, stop trying to run back to those places. God wants to be in your heart. And that's what you want to do. You stuck on a place. You stuck on a pew. That's your family pew. Us always sat there. And God says, now, I just stop where you're going to find me. I want you to 
meet me. I want to meet you in your heart. All right. So then he tells them he's, they just don't want to hear the truth, y'all. And, and they start perverting the word of God because they don't want to hear the truth. They start ignoring the men of God, the women of God, the people of God. They don't want to hear the truth of God's word. They don't want to hear it. And so they do everything in their power to um, mistreat people. And they do and they do everything they're big and bad enough to do. Because remember, at this time, they're prospering. And it's something dangerous when you start prospering. You start thinking like you don't need God. I got this. I don't need him. I, I'm doing good. I must be blessed because I, he's prospering me. Only that they would listen, danger was on the horizon. Okay, let's go back into it. I'm going to read up until uh, verse number 12. Look at verse 12. They said, he tread upon the poor and they take the burdens of wheat and, and build houses of hewn stone, but you won't dwell in them. Verse 11, God said, you can build up all you want. You can plant all your plants, but you're not going to be there. He said, you can plant your pleasant vineyards. Grow your, grow your best vines. Well, guess what? You're not going to drink the wine of them because I know your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins. They afflict the just. They take a bribe and they turn aside the poor in the gate from their right. Therefore, the prudent shall keep silence in that time, for it is an evil time. But listen to what God says. You seek good and not evil that you may live. Stop worrying about what everybody else is doing. Listen, other people's sin is not a justification for you to get in sin. You do what's right by God. You seek good and not evil that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, shall be with you as ye have spoken. This, this is where we got to get to the point of, y'all. I say this a lot, but I want y'all to hear from the from the word of Amos. Amos says in verse 15, chapter 5, verse 15, Hate the evil and love the good and establish judgment in the gate. Oh my God. Let's 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 rehearse that. Hate the evil and love the good and establish judgment in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. So what is God telling us to do? Hate the evil. But you can't hate the evil if you're trying to get with the evil. You can't hate the evil. That sounds like to me, I've got to be able to discern what's good and what's evil. So now discernment, depending upon what dictionary you look at, it, sound a little bit like judgment to me. I'm not judging you, condemning you, but I got to discern what you're doing. I got to discern what I'm operating in because the word tells me hate the evil and do what? And love the good. So I can't hate and love unless I discern what they are. So I want to free up some believers tonight. You keep hearing people tell you, you can't judge me. You know, you're not God. I'm not trying to be God. Trust me. You don't want me to try to be God. No. But what I am going to do, I'm going to do what he told me to do. I'm going to hate what he hates and I'm going to love what he loves. See, this is where people don't understand because they think when you hate their sin, that must mean that you hate them. Those are two different things. I can hate your actions and still love you. Listen, there have been some things that my children have done over the years. I hated. I, I despised it. But I didn't turn that action around and, and label my child as that action. I hated what they did, but I still love my baby. And that's how we got to understand the word. And see, the world can't understand that because they don't understand God's love. How can God hate my sin, and yet die on the cross so I don't have to die in my sin because he loves us in spite of what we've already done and what we will do. So we got to do what Amos says, hate the evil, love the good. Pop that back up. That's so good. Hate the evil, love the good, and establish judgment in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. Therefore. The Lord God of hosts, the Lord saith, wailing shall be in all the streets, and they shall say in all the highways, alas, alas, and they shall call the husband to mourning, and such as are skillful in lamentation to wailing. They're going to call for the, the mourners 
and they're going to be wailing. It's going to get bad. It's going to get bad for these people. It's going to get bad. But they don't want to deal with the sin. They don't. They want to keep doing what they're doing. And God says, no, it's going to get bad. It's going to get kind of rough. And all the vineyards shall be wailing, for I will pass through thee, saith the Lord. God said, I'm going to be behind it. I'm going to be the one that's bringing the calamity. I'm going to be the one that's, that's allowing these things to happen. Because I've tried to get your attention, and you would not heed my call. So now he turns the corner and he says, woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. See, people are like, oh, I want the day of the Lord to come. No, you don't. No, you don't. You don't. It's a day of judgment. It's a day that God is going to deal with stuff in us. Okay. That's why we got to make sure that we align ourselves with the Lord now. As if a man did flee from a lion. And a bear met him. God said, that's how the day of the Lord is going to be. You thought you got out of the one thing and you're going to fall right into something else. And lean his hand on the wall. And then a serpent bit him. In other words, <laughs> there's going to be no escaping when God judges and God deals with their sin. Verse 20. Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very darkness and no brightness in it? This is what we need to understand. Please underline this next couple of verses in your Bible if you can. God says, I hate, I despise your feast days, and I will not swell in your solemn assemblies. God said, I will not show up, I will not manifest my presence in your solemn religious assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beast. God said, you're not going to be able to pray your way out of this. You're not going to be able to, to uh, be religious and work your way out of it. God says, I will no longer accept your offerings. I will no longer accept your religious activities because that's not what I want. Look at verse 22. He says, though you offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I won't accept them. I will not regard your peace offerings of your fat beast. Take thou away from me the noise of that song. God literally says, y'all, oh my God, my God, my God. The Lord literally says that your music is just noise. He says just noise. It's not heartfelt. It's just simply noise. That's a dangerous place to be, to where we get so comfortable in sin. We get so comfortable being out of alignment with God that we think that God's just going to bless him because we call on his name. God says, your worship will become mere noise to me when you don't get yourself aligned with him. Just like the word tells us in 1 Corinthians, I believe it's chapter 13, the, the love chapter, when it says, you know, if you don't operate in love, you just you just loud sound and sound, clamor, you're just making noise. God said, if you don't love me and don't obey me, your worship is just noise. I don't know about y'all, but I want my noise to be a joyful noise unto the Lord. I want, I want him to be pleased in my music, pleased in my worship. So I need you to hear me. If you're on a choir and you know your life is not lined up with the Lord, if you sing or you whatever you do, whatever, however you worship God, and you know you're not in alignment with the word of God, God says it's just noise. He wants you to line it up with him. He wants you to get it right with him. It's just, there's noise. And then there's a joyful noise. There's a difference. There is a difference between noise and a joyful noise. All right. All right. Somebody said, well, pastor, the word said make a noise to the Lord. He did not say make a noise to the Lord. He said make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Okay. There's a difference. Let's keep going. Sister Von Zella, you're so spot on, talking loud and saying nothing. <laughs> Thank you, my sister. God bless you. <laughs> wow, that was good. All right, y'all, let's keep, let's keep moving. So now I want you to pay attention to what he says. Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vows. 
but let judgment run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. Have y'all have y'all heard that before somewhere? Have you ever heard that somewhere? Let, let me let me go to my study notes and and I, hopefully this might this might seem familiar to some of y'all. And this is a little exercise. Last time I taught this, I did it as an exercise. But I want I'm gonna take the the, the words from from a, a famous speech, and I want y'all to identify. Tell me where these words come from. All right, let me get to it in my notes. Bear with me one second. Here we go. Right there, it says, we cannot walk alone. And as we walk, we must make the pledge that we shall always march ahead. We cannot turn back. There are those who are asking the devotees of, of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We can never be satisfied as long as our bodies, heavy with the fatigue of travel, cannot gain lodging in the motels of the highways and the hotels of the cities. We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro's basic mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger one. We can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by a sign stating for whites only. We cannot be satisfied so long as the Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and the Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. No, no, we are not satisfied and will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Does anyone know that is that's Dr. Martin Luther King, famous quote from Dr. King. Dr. King was not just a civil rights leader. He was a prophetic man of God. And I think sometimes we forget that. And, 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 and when I read from him, it challenges me because oftentimes we, we, we are silent when we need to be speaking. Dr. King knew the word of God. He loved God. He was not a perfect man, neither any of us, but he loved God and he served God and his teaching and his preaching was prophetic. His speeches were prophetic and he often had biblical themes intertwined with them. This is what it looks like to be in the world, but not of the world. This is what it looks like to be an Amos to where you're speaking to those in authority. You're speaking to power. You're speaking to prestige. And yet you hold true to the word of God. When you align yourself with God, then God can use you to align other people with his purposes. I just want to share that. That's one of the most famous um, uses that we see of the word of God, the book of Amos through Dr. King's um, speech there. OK. Now, going back to the text, y'all, if y'all if y'all getting blessed from this, pop in some likes and loves. Let us know um, if this is really blessing y'all or not. OK. We want to continue to grow this ministry. All right. So let's go back to Amos. Amen. Thank y'all. God bless you. So then he goes on and says, but you have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch. And chewing your images, the star of your God, which you made to yourselves. In other words, you have literally taken on your, your ungodly guys, your Molochs and your Chewins. And by the way, with Molech, when you start looking up what, what some of these guys represent, that for me, and you start looking up some of the organizations that we get so caught up in. You start looking at the gods that they actually that they use as symbols, some of them, it'll open your eyes to a lot of things. I'm gonna, I said it just that way to tease you so you go dig on it and, and read yourself. Do a little study on Molech, M-O-L-E-C-H or M-O-L-O-C-H, and Chewon. Okay. Gods of the stars and all that stuff. People, yeah, people don't want to hear this, but it's just it is what it is. And so therefore, God says in verse 27. I will cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, saith the Lord, whose name is the God of 
hosts. And so we finished chapter five and, and now we turn our, our, our attention to chapter six. Now I did not do a lot of the scriptures that are, that are in the study notes, but I promise you, if you download the study notes, many of the points that were given to y'all so far are actually um, shared with scriptures attached to them so that you can go back and dig and read and, um, you know, elaborate a little bit more on your own time. All right. Let me put the link to the study notes up again. It's jbchopkins.org forward slash study notes. If somebody wouldn't mind, please put that in the in the chat section for me. I would appreciate it. Thank you. all All right. Matter of fact, I do have a second. Let me do that. JBC Hopkins org. All right. You can, if you click on that link, you can um, get to the, the study notes. Praise God. All right. So let's keep moving. Chapter six. So now God is talking to us about alignment in a little bit different perspective. He's telling them, he says, y'all should be, y'all should be wide awake and paying attention, but everybody's comfortable. Everybody's at ease. Nobody wants to listen. Everybody's just doing what they do. And judgment is, is, is on the way. Okay. There comes a point, y'all, where it's too late to get in line. As long as there's breath in your body, you got a chance to get it right with God. I didn't say you're going to be perfect. None of us are. But you have an opportunity to repent of your sins and say, Lord, help me. Help me to do better. Help me to live the way you want me to live. Help me to be who you call me to be. God, I need your help. I can't do this by myself. Let's read chapter six. Amos chapter six, beginning at verse number one. Where it says, woe to them that are at ease in Zion. Just chilling. And trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations to whom the house of Israel came. Pass ye unto Calneh and see, and from thence go to Hamath the great. Then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Be they better than these kingdoms? Are their border greater than your border? Yet that put far away from the evil day and cause the seat of violence to come near that lie upon beds of ivory. This is how the people are. They so chilling. They having a party. They're just good. No problems. Life is good to them. That lie upon their beds of ivory and stretch themselves upon their couches and eat the lambs out of the flock and the cows out of the midst of the stall. Now, on special occasions, they would eat the best. But these people chilling so much that they eat the best every day. Every day they just they just splurging it up. They just living outlandish. They just they just doing it. They they living their best life. And watch this. Watch the Bible. Oh my God. Here we go. Verse three. Let me back up. Back up. I missed something. I wanted to point out to you. Let me back up. Look at verse three. Ye that put far away the evil day and cause the seed of violence to come near. So in other words, they procrastinate. They keep putting it off. Oh, I got time. I'm good, procrastinating, comfortable in sin, just chilling. I'll do it next. I'll do it next Sunday. Oh, well, I, I'm still young. I got time. I don't need to tell my children to serve God. I don't need to witness to them. They're young. They got to sow their oats first and then they'll get it together. You know, we all had a, we all went to that stage. You know, we, we make excuses, putting it off, <clears throat> but it's coming and you don't know when. They're lying in sin. They're, they're comfortable in sin. They they just chilling. But then watch what it says. Verse five, that chant to the sound of the vow and invent to themselves instruments of music like David. Now, this is where, whoo, Jesus, let's talk about the music. Let's talk about the music. I'm a musician, y'all. Yeah, let's talk about the music. So these people were chilling. They were so comfortable in sin, they were so comfortable and chilling and doing what they were doing. They started taking the instruments that were created to worship God and they start using them to create ungodly music. And so, some translations of the words chant there, they literally were dancing, they were getting their groove on and living all kind of way. They, they, they're spreading 
the ungodly music. And then, then they started creating songs. They started improv improving. They started making other genres, other styles of music. And notice what it says. Notice what it says. Notice where it started. Because we, we got this misnomer that the, where the church gets music from the world. But I need to show you something. Look at verse 5 again. That chant to the sound of the vow and invent to themselves instruments of music, comma, like David. Wait a minute. So you mean to tell me that God's people took what was created to worship God and started worshiping themselves and started um, twisting it and, and worshiping idol gods? They started taking instruments that were consecrated and made the worship God and using them for ungodly music? Yeah. Let me show you this scripture. It'll help you out. It'll help you out. It'll help you out. Let's go over to First Chronicles. First Chronicles. Chapter 23. And look at verse 5. Somebody said, well, Pastor, I didn't know David made instruments. Oh, yes, he did. Watch what he says. First Chronicles chapter 3. I'm going to... Let's read verses four and five. Glory to God. David says, of which 20 and 4,000 were set for the work of the house of the Lord, and 6,000 were officers and judges. Moreover, 4,000 were porters, and 4,000 praised the Lord. 4,000 praised the Lord, watch this, with the instruments which I made said David, to praise their will. They made instruments to praise God in his house. And David says, I made the instruments. I invented them. And they were created. These instruments were created. The viol, some of these instruments were created to give God praise. Now we understand when the Psalm says in Psalm 150, let everything they have breath praise the Lord. Start praising with the timbre and the dance and the psaltery and the heart all these different instruments, they were created to worship God. But the people of God, in their sinfulness, they took instruments that, they took creativity and innovation and ingenuity that they were using to create things to glorify God, and now they're creating things to glorify the enemy. Oh, my God. Wow. I know. I know. I know. I know it's tight, but it's right. I promise you. It's there. And so this is the danger of when we don't recognize. And we all, I've, I've heard people say this a lot of times. Well, you know, half the secular artists in the world, they grew up in the church. Yeah, they did. And many of them, when they were creating different styles of music, some of us being religious ran them away. So they went right into the world, right into the world, a world that was waiting on them. Improv. Yeah, you look up the words, the Hebrew words behind some of what it said there. Improv. Yeah, that was for God. It's it's so funny how in church we have this rehearsed praise. We say the same things over and over again. But you, when you begin to pray, when you begin to worship God, that's why sometimes praise team, y'all know what I'm talking about. We can be in worship, and all of a sudden, on the spot, we just make up a song. We just start worshiping and we feel something. We just go in that flow. That's that's what they were doing during David's time. That's biblical, y'all. Yeah, it's biblical. So Sometimes we have to go back and listen to the tape and say, oh, my God, did anybody get that? Or you can be in praise and you can be in rehearsal. And all of a sudden, in pride will just come. The Lord will begin to pour out something musically. Pour out of your spirit. You might write a poem or something. You don't even know where it's coming. You need to record those thoughts and those words because that's the Lord. That's the Holy Ghost working through you, giving you innovation, innovations and ingenuity, creating worship to him. But when we don't receive that and we don't discern it as God, then it becomes something that's used in the world. That's a sad scripture. It says they did this and they took songs and music, made instruments like David. Like David, the world is nothing but a cheap copy of the kingdom. It's just trying to copy what God did. Didn't the devil say, I will be like the most high God? So the worst, the, the best he can do is try to imitate what God has already done. And here it is. We've fallen for the imitation instead of 
holding to the original. I, I give this illustration many a time. If you if you think you can take a a um a thousand dollars or take take a hundred dollar bill and put it on a copy and say and go into the store and say, hey, I'm gonna pay with this. You going to jail. Secret service coming for you. You going to jail. Yeah, why? Because that's counterfeit. And here it is in our churches, here it is in society. The world doesn't respect the house of God, the people of God, many times because we're we're so holding and beholden to counterfeits instead of holding to the truth of God's word, which we have in righteousness. So God says, I need you to stop looking for the counterfeits and hold to the truth of my word. Glory to God. Glory to God. Let me move on. Let me move on. I'm almost there. Almost there. We're almost where we're going to stop. Praise God. And so as we go back to the book of Amos, we go back to Amos chapter six. We're going to pick up our reading um, at verse number. Yes, let's pick it up at verse number. Hmm. Let's go back to verse number nine. Thank you, Lord. Listen to the word. Verse 8 says, the Lord God has sworn by himself, saith the Lord, God of hosts, I abhor the excellency of Jacob and hate his palaces. Therefore, will I deliver up the city with all that is therein. I'm sorry, y'all. I skipped some stuff. Let me back up a little bit. Yes, let's go back to verse 5 again. That chant to the sound of the vow and invent to themselves instruments of music like David. That drink wine in bowls. y'all." They ain't they ain't got they ain't drinking wine in no cup now they drinking it in bowls and by the way these bowls oftentimes were used um for other purposes dealing with sacrifice and and some 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 of our reading was they, they were used to handle blood or whatever but they are drinking wine in bowls that's just how outlandish they are and they anoint themselves with the chief ointments but they are not greed for the affliction of Joseph they just having high time they living it up. They they just anointing themselves. Y'all see anybody, people anointing them. You can anoint all you want, but if you're not right, you're not right. And it says, therefore shall, now shall they go captive with the first that go captive. God said these religious people who always got, always looking for pleasure, the first pleasures, you want the first pleasure, you're going to have the first captivity. That's what he's saying. And the banquet of them that stress themselves shall be removed. The Lord God has sworn by himself, saith the Lord God of hosts, I abhor the excellency of Jacob and his and his and hate his palaces. Therefore will I deliver up the city with all that is therein. And it shall come to pass, if there remain ten men in one house, that they shall die. And a man's uncle shall take him up, and he that burneth him to bring out the bones out of the house, and shall say unto him, that is by the size of the house. Is there yet any with thee? He shall say no. Then shall he say, hold thy tongue. For we may not make mention of the name of the Lord. For behold, the Lord commandeth, and he will smite the great house with breaches and the little house with clefts. Shall horses run upon the rock? Will one plow there with oxen? For you have turned Judgment into guile and the fruit of righteousness into him luck. Ye which rejoice in a thing of naught, which say, Have we not taken up us horns by our own strength? But behold, God says, I will raise up against you a nation. O house of Israel, saith the Lord God of hosts, and they shall afflict you from the entering in of Hemath unto the river of the wilderness. Y'all, I hate to leave in, in, in that particular manner. With that particular scripture, but I think you get the point. God has given his people opportunity, just like he's given us opportunity to align our lives with God. And as we come to the conclusion of this particular study, we're not going to stop with Amos. We're going to finish the book of Amos, but our focus beginning on this coming Wednesday, um, the theme for the month of February is refinement, refinement. So we're going to spend a little bit of time um, and talking Amos, the visions that he got um, in Amos chapter seven um, and talking through chapter nine. That will be where the Lord allows us to go next week if it's by his grace. OK, 
So I pray that this has been a blessing to y'all. Thank y'all. This has been cool hanging out with y'all. But listen, don't get so caught up in living the, living for yourself, living your best life that you forget to serve the Lord and to honor him and stay in alignment with his will and his purpose for your life. Listen, if you need prayer, do me a favor. Um, put in the comment section whatever your prayer request is. I know God can meet it and God can make a way for you. It's already made. You just have to walk into it. I believe God to do great things in all of our lives. He wants to start by you coming to him. You got to ask him. Some things you don't get access to because we don't ask. The word says, if you know how to get, you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will God give the Holy Spirit? How much more will he pour out upon us if we would ask him? So God wants to meet our needs. He told us to cast all of our cares upon him for he cares for us. Whatever it is you're dealing with, we believe God tonight with you, that God is going to meet that need in the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Sister Patterson, I see your prayer for faith in his healing. Absolutely. We believe God to be your healing in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Are there others? Any prayer requests? Glory to God. Glory to God. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what they said. God has the final say. He has the final word. Glory to God. Thank you, Brother Duran. Pray for Pastor and his family and JBC family, his family and, and our mothers. Glory to God. Sister Von Zella says she know God can meet all of, of our needs. Amen. Sister Ali asks for prayer for her family. Absolutely. Thank you. Glory to God. Sister Max, Minister Max asks for prayer for our schools. Absolutely. Sister Jacqueline, praying for everyone. Amen. All right. All right. Y'all keep those prayer requests coming in. Savannah, prayer for healing for 17 year old Nicholas Campbell in ICU with pneumonia and low oxygen levels. We believe God to open those lungs and heal him even as we speak, God, in Jesus' name. Yes, Lord. Pray for the Harvin family, the Champer family. Gilly Meekins and Arnold families and JVC family. Amen. Thank you, Sister Avon. God bless you. All right, Lord, y'all. Listen, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Keep those prayer requests coming. If I don't call your name out, we will we will continue um, to look at the, the prayer requests and we will um, go before the Lord on your behalf as well. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. We thank you that you have done what you said you would do. And now, God, we ask that you would seal your word in our hearts, Lord, that we will be reminded of what you've done. God, help us, Lord, God, as we stand in need of healing, God, need of a prayer for children in our schools and in the chaos that's going on around us, God. God, we need you to make, make us whole, God, to help us to realize who we already are in you. We need you, Lord God, to, to reaffirm in us, Lord God, that the greater one lives inside of us, God. We thank you, God, for healing our bodies and healing us of all sickness and disease. We thank you that there's nothing that you cannot do, God. God, all things are possible to him that believes. And we believe your word tonight, God. My sister asks that you increase her faith, God, as she goes through the process of healing, God. I believe, God, that as she leaves this Bible study tonight, that you're going to put a smile on her face. And I believe by faith, God, that you're going to give her an assurance in her spirit that she is healed already in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord God, for every person that has lost a loved one, Lord God. We thank you for, for the young man that's in the hospital and those that are dealing with COVID and pneumonia and all kinds of respiratory illnesses, and all the kinds of other sicknesses, Father. We thank you that you are their healer, God, that you are their strong place, that you are the one that gave the wind of the breath of life into them, God. I ask that you breathe upon them now, God. Remove everything that's in their body that's attacking that's not of you, Lord God. Remove, remove the impurities, Lord God. Remove the disease. Remove the cancer. God, you are able to heal the diabetes, Lord God. You're able to regulate the blood pressure, God, in the name of Jesus. You're able to dissolve the clots in a safe way, God, that they do no harm to the body. Lord, you're able to, to give that brother, that sister recovery from the stroke, Lord God. You're able to do what the doctors don't even know how to do, God, because you are the chief physician. And we thank you, God. You're able to bring peace to that mind that's been troubled, Lord God. You're able to soothe that spirit 
that's been discouraged and in despair. You're able to bring esteem where there's been low self-esteem, God, in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, God. We thank you for your power. God, we stand in the gap for that person, Lord God, that's on the verge of committing suicide tonight. Oh, you will not die. You will live. You will live. You shall live in the name of Jesus. You shall live. Your life is not an accident. Your life is not a mistake. God has purpose for your life in the name of Jesus. I thank you, God, that those are the words you're speaking into their spirit right now, God. Oh, God, I thank you, Lord God, for removing them from that vicinity, Lord God. I thank you, God, for covering them right now in the name of Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord God. Thank you for doing what needs to be done right now, Father, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Father. Mm. Thank you, God. Oh, God, I thank you. I thank you, God. I thank you, God. I thank you, God. They shall live, God. They shall live, God, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord God. And Father, we pray, God, for the person that needs to be saved tonight. Not only physically, Lord God, but spiritually, Lord God. Lord, I pray that they will open their heart to you, God, to, tonight, Lord, that this will be the day of salvation for them. And for that, Father, we love you. We adore you. We call it done even now in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, if that's you that's not saved, they have never confessed Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Tonight is the night. Tonight's the night for you. God wants to save you. Listen. Put in the comment section right now. Don't think about it. Don't, don't delay. Don't, don't procrastinate. Put in the comment section. I want to be saved. 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 Glory to God. Glory to God. Don't allow the devil to steal this moment from you. Put it in the comment section. I want to be saved. If you're that person that's looking for a church family, and you've been and you're right there and you know God is calling you. You know what God is telling you to do. And you want to join Jerusalem Baptist Church. Put it in the comments. I want to join JBC. I want to join. I want to join JBC. I want to join JBC. Glory to God. Glory to God. Listen, God is up to something good. We're going to be talking about refinement all month. The month of February, if the Lord allows us to see it. I look forward to seeing y'all in worship on Sunday morning. Don't miss what God is doing. Bible study this coming Friday night. The ladies will be at 8, 10 with First Lady. Men, we're going we're gonna to go live right at 8 o'clock on this Friday as well. I look forward to what God is doing in your lives. And I'm excited that he is a promise keeper. And he will do exceeding abundantly above all you can ask to think by the power he placed inside of you. It's going to come to pass. As you align your life with God, put your hand over your heart real quick. Put your hand over your heart and say, Lord, help me to align my life with you. Help me to align my life with you. And Father, you know every person that's prayed the prayer. As we leave this call tonight, you're better than you were before you got on. Them. I pray the peace of God over your life. Be blessed and know that God is up to something great in your life life. We'll see you soon. God bless.